Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice. The breakfast cereals shot from guns present Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. There's no one that can make a better cereal than Quaker popped wheat. It's neat. And when you hear that shootin', you're darn tootin'. The Quaker makes the ones shot from guns. Fellas and girls, here's a tip. Eat a better breakfast, enjoy a better day. Say, just picture yourself in Sergeant Preston's shoes, battling desperate outlaws, fighting blizzards on dog sled journeys. Well, you'd soon find out that real stamina calls for a nourishing He-Man breakfast. So remember, every time you eat a heaping bowl full of delicious, crisp, Quaker-popped wheat or Quaker-popped rice, you get extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So for a nourishing treat, eat swell-tasting Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. The spring thaw had come to the Yukon Territory, and the first riverboat from the States brought a capacity load of new arrivals to Dawson. Two men stood at the rail, waiting for the crowd to thin out before going ashore. Bart Allen, a large, rough-looking man, stared at the crude buildings of the town. Then he spoke to his companion. Well, Bill, this is it. Not much to look at. I'd hate to think we were going to get stuck here with the little cash we have between us, Bart. Don't let that worry you. Remember what I told you about Fred Bertram? He used to be in the gang with me in the States. Yeah, didn't you say he did a stretch in prison in Frisco? Yeah, and now he's office manager of the Dawson Mining Company. <laughs> I think Fred will be glad to see that we don't starve, just to make sure we keep our mouths shut about his past. Yeah. I figure he isn't going to be too happy to set eyes on you, Bart. Maybe not. But that isn't going to make any difference to me. Come on. It's time we went ashore. As soon as we get settled in a room somewhere, we'll look up Fred Burton. Let's go. It was later that day when Bart and Bill entered the mining office in Dawson. The manager, Fred Bertram, was alone in the office and was busy at his desk. He looked up as the two men approached. Oh, good afternoon. What can I do for you? I guess you don't remember me, do you, Fred? Well, you are familiar, but I... <coughs> Bart. Bart Allen. That's all right. Meet my partner, Bill Calvin. Howdy, Bertram. Hello, Calvin. Well, it's been a long time since I saw you, Bart. What brings you to the Yukon? I think there's plenty of easy cash up here, Fred. And I think, too, that you're the one to tell us how to go about getting some of it. Everybody works for it up here, Bart. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> I was inquiring about you around town. I hear you're doing right well. I've worked hard to get where I am. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, must be about five years since you got out of prison down in Frisco, isn't it? That's right, it is. But why bring that up? I paid my debt to society by staying in prison three years. I've gone straight ever since. Well, now that's mighty inspiring, isn't it, Bill? <laughs> He's gone straight for five long years. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he might convert us if he tries hard enough. Get to the point, Bart. What do you want? Why did you come here to see me? All right, I'll get to the point. 
No man with a prison record ever gets to be manager of a big mine unless he lied about his past. Now, we need some ready cash. And if you don't want the past to catch up with you, Fred, you better see that we get some. Right now. So you came here to blackmail me, is that it? Put it that way if you like. I understand a man named Maitland owns this mining company. Now, if you don't want him to find out about his office manager, you better get off your high horse and deal with his friendly life. Well, I... Well, here's $50. It's about all I have in my wallet. Fifty measly dollars? Why, Oh, wait, you... Bart. Take it. That'll help a little for the present. Uh, give me that. <laughs> I guessed right. Maitland doesn't know that you did time in prison. Now, be reasonable, Bart. You know I was only 19 when I... Well, got mixed up with you and the others. At 20, I was sent to prison, even though I hadn't really been on any of the robberies with a gang. Four years ago, I married. I came here for a fresh start. Maitland gave me a job, and I made good. Why not forget the past and let us alone? Gosh, Fred, that sob story of yours has done something to me. <laughs> yeah, it shows me where our easy money is going to come from. Oh. Oh, for a second, I thought you'd gone soft-hearted, Bart. Bertram, we'll take the 50 as a sort of a small promise of what to expect in the future. Uh -huh. Now, pleasant dreams, my friend. We'll be back in a day or so to have another talk. <laughs> Let's go, Bill. That night, Fred Bertram, worried by the threat out of the past to his security and happiness, slept very little. At breakfast next morning, the strain was evident, not only from his appearance, but also from the way he barely touched his food. His wife, Beatrice, concerned by his looks and attitude, remarked, Fred, something's wrong. What is it? Wrong? What gave you that idea, B? The way you look, Fred. And you've eaten so little. Oh, I... I didn't sleep very well, that's all. Perhaps you're working too hard at the office. No, no, it's nothing. Forget it. <laughs> I have to start for the office. I have a lot to do today. Oh, before you leave, I need some cash. Will you give me ten dollars? I... Sorry, but I haven't any cash, B. Oh, but, dear, yesterday you said you had fifty dollars. Have you forgotten? I said I haven't any cash, so there's no use nagging me about it. I'm going to the office now. Goodbye. That evening, the crook, Bill Calvin, entered the hotel room he shared with Bart Allen. Well, Bill, came back from the cafe earlier than I expected. I got into a card game and lost all the cash you gave me. We'll have to hit that friend of yours for more, Bart. I doubt if he'll have any more till payday. Uh, listen, I heard a couple of miners talking in the cafe. Seems that tomorrow is payday, and they go to the mining office to collect. Well... I noticed that Fred Bertram is working late at the office. I saw him through the window as I passed by. What are you leading up to, Bill? Just this. Putting two and two together, I figure he's there making up the payroll. That means there's plenty of cash in that office right now. Oh, and you think we might have a chance to get it, is that it? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. With the hold you have over Bertram, it seems to me we could force him to open the safe and give us that dough. And we could figure some way to let him take the blame. <laughs> You're smarter than I gave you credit for, Bill. If the money was gone from the safe and Fred disappeared, they'd blame him as soon as the police here checked his past record. And what are we waiting for? Let's get to the mining office before he leaves. Right. <clears throat> but first we have to figure out a getaway for the three of us. Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. I think I have the answer. The boat leaves at midnight for Selkirk. Yeah. Uh... I made enough last night gambling to buy three tickets. Now, we'll force Fred to open the safe, and we'll knock him out. And between the two of us, we'll get him on board. The dock is close to the mining office. Yeah, but somebody might ask questions when we try to go aboard. I'll fix that. Don't you worry. Now, let's go to the mine office and get that payroll. At the mining office, Fred Bertram had finished making up the payroll and had locked the money in the safe. He turned out the light and went to the front door of his office. He unlocked the door and started out when... We've been waiting for what? you to come out, Fred. Step back inside quick or I'll use this gun. Now, Bart, hold on. Get up and get inside like he said. I'll hold this gun at his back, Bill, while you light the lamp on his desk. Shades are down so nobody will see us. Right. All right, Bart. Now, Fred, just stand below over there and open that safe. Maitland has the combination. Don't stall. I know you have it, too. Now, get over there, so help me, I'll plug you. Now, go on. Now, Bart, wait a minute. I told you. I'm open not... it. Or maybe you want a bullet. Well, I... 
I'll open it. That bag in there must be the payroll. Get it, Bill. Sure. I have it. Now close and lock the safe. You'll not get away with this. There's 5,000 in that bag keep and you, you won't... quiet. No. Oh, you gave him a nasty cut on the head, Bart. He'll get over it. Make sure the coast is clear out front. Then we'll hold him between us like he's had too much to drink and head for the boat. Now hurry. And don't forget to lock the door after us. Fred's wife, Beatrice, waited all night for his return. Then, worried and upset, she first went to the office, which she found locked. Then she went to police headquarters and was talking to Sergeant Preston, the Northwest Mounted Police. I don't know what to make of it, Sergeant. Fred has never stayed away from home all night before. You say you stopped by the mining office? Yes. The door was locked, so I came here. Fred wasn't himself this morning at breakfast. I feel something is terribly wrong, and I'm very much worried. Please find him for me, Sergeant. Well, I suggest you go back to your cabin and wait, Mrs. Bertram. I'll do what I can to locate Fred. I'll send you word as soon as I do. If, if anything has happened to him, Don't I... worry. Now, you go along home. All right, Sergeant. But please let me know as soon as you find out anything. Of course. After Beatrice Bertram left headquarters, Sergeant Preston, with his dog, Yukon King, went to the mining office. He found the owner, Mr. Maitland, just unlocking the front door. Morning, Mr. Maitland. Oh, good morning, Sergeant. Hey, come inside, Sergeant. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Mrs. Bertram has reported that her husband didn't come home last night. She's quite upset. Well, that isn't at all like Fred. He's a very reliable and steady type of man. <laughs> Of course, if he and his wife had a spat, she perhaps... She claims he... there's no reason for his action. As a matter of fact, he should have been here to open up. This is payday, and the men will soon be coming for their pay. I know Fred was here last night making up the pay envelopes. I see. If you don't mind, I'll get the payroll from the safe and be ready for the man. Eh? All right. Uh, yes. uh. Sergeant, come here, quick. What's the matter? Uh, the payroll is gone. There was 5000 in cash. It... And the only one who could have taken it from the safe is Fred Bertram. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. You know, fellas and girls, you sure bump into a lot of interesting characters when you travel with Sergeant Preston up in the Yukon. Like the time we stopped at the trading post on the way to Whitehorse. In came a jaunty old French trapper called Francois. He had come all the way from... Bonjour, bonjour. Hello there, Francois. <laughs> Say, some pile of furs you've got there. Looks like you can do some big trading. Ah, uh, oui, and I need beaucoup supplies. I get very hungry. Well, whenever I hear anybody say that, I always tell them to stock up on swell-tasting Quaker-puffed wheat and Quaker-puffed rice. Mm -hmm. Are they tasty? Why, say, you've never tasted anything so delicious. They're the breakfast cereals shot from guns to make them crisp and tender. Oh. Bigger and better tasting. Mm. There's bang-up nut-like flavor in every mouthful. Ooh, la, la. My mouth, it is watering. Well, just wait till you taste those choice premium kernels that are actually exploded up to eight times normal size. But why wait? Wheat, let us eat. <laughs> ah, good idea for you fellas and girls, too. Just top with milk or thick, rich cream and your favorite fruit for a very swell treat. Eat delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. The breakfast cereals shot from gun. Now to continue. When Mr. Maitland opened the safe in front of Sergeant Preston, he discovered the payroll was missing. He immediately suspected Fred Bertram. Everything in the office was in order and the safe was locked, Sergeant. Under the circumstances, it must have been Fred who made off with that cash. That's why he didn't go home last night. Well, as I say, nothing in here seems to be disturbed. It does look as though he... What's that? Hey, what are you looking at? Here on the floor. Yeah, those stains weren't there when I left early last night. But red ink might have... These stayed. are blood stains. Huh? 
Are you sure? Yes. Does Fred usually keep the doors locked when he's here alone at night? Uh, yes, of course. And remember, the doors were still locked when I arrived a few moments ago. I... Oh. Hey, I want to tell you something, Sergeant. About four years ago, I gave Fred a job because I instinctively liked him. Well? He did exceptionally well and advanced steadily. And a year ago, he became office manager. Shortly after, I went to San Francisco on business. At a meeting, Fred's name as office manager was mentioned. Go on. A newspaper friend of mine recalled a young outlaw by that name who had spent a few years in prison. I knew Fred had come from San Francisco, so I checked at police headquarters. They had Fred's picture and report. You told him what you'd found out? No, no, no. I thought of the matter all the way back to the Yukon. Then I decided as long as he had been so trustworthy and faithful while with my company, I... I'd forget his past. This is the result. Don't lose your faith in Fred yet, Mr. Maitland. And I suggest you say nothing to anyone else about his past until I find him. All right, Sergeant, just as you say. I'd like to look through Fred's desk, if I may. Yes, of course. Yeah, this is it. Hmm, oh, a pair of gloves. I think King can make use of one of these to get Fred sent here, boy. But, uh... How do you expect him to help? I hope King will find the scent outside and follow it. Find him, King. <coughs> See you later, Mr. Maitland. Outside, the big husky stopped a moment, sniffing. A faint scent of the man he was to find led toward Fred's cabin. But a stronger scent of the same man led in the other direction, toward the docks. The intelligent dog started after the stronger scent. <coughs> oh, he's heading toward the docks. Find him, King. <coughs> A short time later, Sergeant Preston and King stood on the dock at the spot where the gangplank of the riverboat usually was placed. All right, boy, you've done your part by letting me know he left on the boat. Yeah, that boat usually puts in at Bear Landing, 15 miles up river between here and Selkirk, and she stays there several hours. Now get Blackie. Maybe with hard riding, we'll be able to get to Bear Landing before the boat leaves there. Come on, boy! <laughs> Preston lost no time in getting his horse, Blackie. Then he set out at a gallop along the river trail, with King running alongside. Blackie was well-rested and in top condition, so that the 15 miles were traveled in record time. But as the sergeant approached the dock at Bear Landing, he knew he was too late. He heard the distant whistle of the riverboat as it moved up the river away from the town. Oh, Blackie. Oh, Blackie. Too late. Boat's gone. Well, I'll head for the constable's office. This way, King. Get up, Blackie. Come on, now. A few minutes later, Preston entered the constable's office. Sergeant Preston, what brings you here? Briefly, the sergeant told what had happened and of his desire to catch the boat. Then he asked... Constable, do you know of a motorboat we could use to go after the riverboat? Yes, I do. The dockmaster has a motorboat of the latest model. With that, we shouldn't have any trouble catching up with the riverboat. Good. There's no time to lose. We'll take King with us. Let's go. Come on, King. In a cabin aboard the riverboat, Fred Bertram lay on one of the bunks, tied hand and foot. His head was crudely bandaged, and he felt weak from the blow he had received the night before. He listened as Bart and Bill discussed the situation. <laughs> I told you it'd be easy to bring him on board, Bill. Nothing to it. I thought the boat would never leave that last town, Bear Landing. We must have stopped there for hours. Yeah, I asked one of the crew about that. Seems they transport lumber from a mill here and take it to Selkirk. I've been wondering, Bart, what are we going to do with Bertram after we get him to Selkirk? I have that all figured out, too. Only he's not going to get to Selkirk. Uh, what do you mean? The boat arrives there about dawn tomorrow. So during the night when nobody's around, we just carry Fred on deck and dump him overboard. No, no. Uh, keep quiet. Don't. Don't kill me, Bart. Let me go. You can get away by the time I get back to Dawson. Bart, what's the use of doing that? The police will be looking for him, not for us. And they'll not believe his story about being forced to go with us. My way is safer. You might convince them. No, listen, Bart. Don't kill me. Help! Shut up, you fool. No. If I weren't tied, you wouldn't do that. Keep your mouth shut. Bill, use your bandana to gag him. And from now on, we're taking no chances till we get rid of him. 
Sergeant Preston, with a constable at King, moved rapidly along the Yukon River in the wake of the riverboat. They had sighted the steamer about half a mile ahead. And as they moved along, the constable was saying, How will we get aboard, Sergeant? We'll run past the boat until we can be seen from the wheelhouse. And I'll signal them to stop and let us aboard. They'll be able to see we're police. Well, since you're after just one fellow, Fred Bertram, perhaps I'd better stay in this boat while you go aboard. No, we'll tie up alongside. I have an idea I may need both you and King. Should be alongside soon. A short time later, in the wheelhouse, the helmsman spoke to the mate on duty. Look, sir. Two Mounties in that motorboat out there. One of them is signaling, seems like. Yes. Yes, he is. Seems to want us to stop. They must want to come aboard. Ring the engine room. Aye, aye, sir. I'll lower the ladder on the port side. Within a short time, Sergeant Preston, King, and the constable stood on the deck of the packet. There you are, King. <laughs> well, officers, what's this all about? Oh, Sergeant Preston. First, I didn't recognize you. We're here to search your boat for crooks, Mr. Ames. Crooks? Well, perhaps if you describe the men you're after, I can help you. I saw the passengers aboard last night. One of them is tall, young, and with blonde hair. Possible that he may have had some sort of injury. Yeah. Tall, young, blonde hair. Well, the only one who came aboard of that description was a fellow who was brought aboard by two other men. Huh? The young man had a head injury. The other said he'd been drinking and been in a brawl. I think those are the men we're after. Where are they? In the stateroom 102. Come on, Constable. I Come along, King. Oh! Inside stateroom 102, Bart had noticed that the boat had stopped. Oh, I wonder why the boat stopped, Bill. You got me. Maybe one of us ought to go on deck and find out. Yeah, go ahead. I'll wait here for you. All right. Hold it, Joe. What? Get back inside. Mounties, what's the idea? Just routine questioning, that's all. Get inside. Come on, Gus. Right, Sergeant. Inside, Bart had heard Bill's exclamation. Quickly, he shoved Fred close to the wall. Then, lying on the bunk beside him, Bart pulled a blanket over them both, completely covering the tied and gagged man. As the two Mounties and Bill came inside, Bart raised on one elbow, and from appearances, he alone was occupying the bunk. Hey, what's this all about? Can't a man get some rest around here? You two men brought a man aboard last night who had a head injury. Or is he? We don't know what you're talking about. Now, wait, hold on, Bill. Mountie must mean that fellow we helped aboard after he was fighting. Go on. What the... That's all there was to it. He had his own stateroom somewhere on board. Shoved us aside after we came on deck. Said he'd take care of himself. We haven't seen him since. A shaft of light slanted through the small window, but most of the cabin was in semi-darkness. The bunk was only vaguely visible in a corner. King, however, caught the scent of the man for whom he searched. He crossed the floor and stood beside the bunk. Hey, what's the matter with this dog? Get him away from this bunk, will you? Just a minute. What is it, King? The intelligent dog suddenly put his front paws on the edge of the bunk. Preston reached out quickly and pulled away the bank. I'll find out what's the matter. Hey! That's Fred Bertram there against the wall. I'll fix you, Mountie. Drop that gun. No! The heavy blow Preston had given Bart caused him to fall to the floor. But hardened as he was, he again grabbed for his gun. The big husky King sprang. No! Take him away! I'll take your gun. Don't, King. Easy, boy. Watch him. I'm the only one covered, Sergeant. I'll take his gun. Here I have it. I'll release Fred. Quickly, the sergeant took away the gag and untied Fred Bertram. Fred briefly told what had happened. When he had finished, Bart snarled. All right, we didn't get away with it. But one satisfaction we have is that Fred will lose his job. You can't keep us from telling about Fred's past. Mr. Maitland knew about Fred's past a year ago. I'm sure, Bart, what you have to say will have no effect on Fred's future with the mining company. Do you mean Mr. Maitland really did know? Yes, Fred. I'm sure when he hears how you resisted these two crooks, he'll know he hasn't made any mistake in trusting you. I'll tie these two crooks and have them ready for the trip back, Sergeant. Good. We'll take Fred and the cash back along with them. I arrest both of you in the name of the Crown for robbery armed and attempted murder. Mr. Maitland knows, and I, I'm mighty glad, Sergeant, but I wonder what B will say when she finds out. Oh, Fred, if Mr. Maitland has trust and faith in you, your wife, who loves you, certainly couldn't have less. I'm sure when you tell her, she'll understand. And from now on, you'll never have to worry about anything out of the past. Now let's get back to the motorboat, Constable. As soon as we get these crooks to jail, this case will be closed. Well, 
with Sergeant Preston will return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. All aboard for your favorite breakfast treat. Yes, get aboard for Quaker Puffed Rice and Quaker Puffed Wheat. Every trip from the bowl to the lip gives the whole family one spoonful after another of the toasty, nut-like flavor of good natural grain. The sun-ripened natural flavor that Mother Nature put into it. Those premium grains are never coated with factory sweetening. As Mother well knows, some of the family like their cereal not so sweet, but others like it ever so sweet. And here's the beauty of Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Your family can sweeten them with sugar to suit their own special taste. Enjoy the bang-up toasty flavor of the ones shot from gun. So, all aboard! Steam over to your store tomorrow and reach for the big red and blue packages of delicious, crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Remember, the sealed inner lining keeps them crisp as can be. And now, here is Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston reporting for duty, Inspector. Sergeant, last night, two men robbed the Dawson Bank. They're heading towards the border with $50,000 worth of gold. How much of a start have they, sir? Six hours. I'll start at once. I should be able to overtake them. I'm concerned about what happens when you overtake them. Both men are killers. It is an assignment that means a race against time. Sergeant Preston is prepared for a showdown fight at the trail's end. But he doesn't suspect that an avalanche is destined to work against the success of his manhunt. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of Sergeant Preston, the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon is brought to you every Tuesday and Thursday at the same time. On Thursday, by Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Boys, girls, hurry. Get this special brand new collection of 18 Braves of Indian Nations trading cards. That's 18 Indian trading cards. All different. All reproductions of original paintings of famous Indians. Set includes Arapaho War Dance, Hopi Snake Dancer, Blackfeet Buffalo Hunter, Sitting Bull, Geronimo Crazy Horse, to name a few. Every card in full colors, stiff back, regular playing card size. These exciting Indian trading cards are not on sale in stores. They're offered only by Quaker Paco 10. That's Quaker Paco 10. Ten crisp, fresh individual servings of six different favorite ready to serve cereals. Remember, only Paco 10 has wheat and rice shot from guns. And inside special new packages, now at grocers, you get a sample Indian trading card free of extra cost. To get an entire collection of 18 in a hurry, do this, but act fast. Supply is limited. Right now, tonight, send name, address, and 10 cents. That's only 10 cents. Together with money back guarantee seal or special order blank from bottom of Paco 10 package. Mail to Indian Cards, Box 712, Chicago 77, Illinois. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Popped Wheat and Quaker Popped Rice. So long. Listen tomorrow at this same time to the Green Hornet, brought to you by the drink that makes you feel fresh again, delicious Orange Crush. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.